Forum and uh, on this lovely snow day. Uh, welcome to the first meeting of the uh, Human Services Reform, Reform Finance and Policy Committee. And so great to see such a robust audience here. I hope they grow over time when they realize how amazing and interesting and important this committee is. We, uh, we'll learn later we touch 1.1 million lives and spend $7 billion. And so pretty much uh, help yourself. It's only $7 billion. Um, we have, uh, I, I never thought I'd be sitting in this chair, frankly, I, uh, for either as a senator or as a, uh, a chairman. And so there's um, a lot of uh, excitement and humility and, uh, and challenge ahead of all of us. And so we're going to spend uh, like two, cycle, two, two meetings doing some overviews. And that'll be the end of the overviews. They're going to be kind of brief. And, uh, and members, some are new, some have been here longer. Uh, some could give the overviews. Um, and, uh, but so if you need to have more information for yourselves, uh, we can arrange private sessions and topics if you like. Um, but there's a, a lot of work that, that has to be done. And so I presume a number of people are monitoring at home as well. So I can, uh, but you're going to want to pay attention to the announcements at the beginning and the end because we're going to try to keep you apprised of what's, uh, what's going to be happening. Uh, we're two days a week, uh, Monday and Wednesday. Um, we were informed a couple days ago that there's caucus on Wednesdays at 4.45. So for those uh, who you like hour, long, hour and a half long meetings, Wednesday is your day. And some people want more time to dig in, to have more content and substance. That's Monday. And so uh, we'll go until at least 5, 5.30 or 6, depending upon the content. And uh, if you've uh, remembered how I ran a meeting before, I don't believe in, in wasting anybody's time. We try to be efficient and have content and focus. But still, we don't have time for dialogue and the room for the public and different um, groups to, to weigh in on the things that are, that are so important. Um, and so uh, just looking ahead, uh, and I think we, we've been talking about our schedule. Uh, uh, we're going to meet Wednesday. And, and Monday, we are so tired from being here so long, we're taking a holiday. Thank goodness uh, for, the, uh, for the holiday that's there. And then Wednesday, we're going to uh, spend some time in a joint meeting with the E12 group talking about uh, what happens uh, about uh, child care and all the things that happened before age five. And uh, there's some other meetings coming. But you, you'll want to mark your calendar for sure for June 30th. Uh, that's a Monday. Remember, long day. And so we're going to do the governor's bill all in one day. And oh, January. What did I say? Oh, June. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so January, yeah. <laughs> oh no, was it subliminal? <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, so January 30th, um, we're going to hear the governor's bill be presented uh, in what totality it requires, and then we'll maybe take a break and have testimony that night. And so the nice thing is that'll be out on January 25th, so people can uh, have a chance to react to that. And so we're going to do that in one day and then pick and choose from that. Um, and I do like starting on time just to respect everybody's time. And you know, it's snowing and it's the first time. But I, uh, I think it's respectful for both the audience, the public, and uh, each member who's been here on time. And so I'm intending to drop the gavel right at the top of the hour, assuming that's feasible. Um, also, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, we have an amazing committee. Uh, there's a lot of experience, some people that are new to this, but not new to the to uh, the world. And so uh, please come as you can. I know things happen. If you're not here, you're excused, because I'm sure there's something you're doing that's very important, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, if you notice, you uh, sat where you chose, which I think is healthy for the mix. And so uh, when you come in, uh, except for maybe uh, one or one person, maybe Senator Utke, who's the vice chair of the spot, but um, the rest of you um, sit where you like, and then the page will find you. And I think that'll create some of the uh, work we need. We have a tremendous amount of work to do. And in this topic, I don't see us as much political work. Uh, this is, there's just too much serious business at hand. And those who want to weigh in with an idea, please do. If you don't want to, uh, fine. But I'm, I intend to use all my members to the extent that they would like to be used in this very, very important work we have. So I, with that, I would like to um, move to introductions of the, uh, the senators who are here. And maybe we'll just start with uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. And just simply, um, if <laughs> maybe you wanted to say uh, like your name, perhaps, and uh, what town you live in, 
and uh, how many years you've been in elective office or something like that. So. <laughs> Okay. <coughs> Hello, everybody. Glad to be here on Health and Human Services Committee. I've spent six years before in Health and Human Services. Took a little break from it to do education for a couple of years and glad to be back again. It's a, a very favorite committee of mine and subject, so I'm glad to be here working on that with you, Chairman Abler. And so my name is Mary Kiffmeyer, and I represent District 30, which are the cities of Big Lake, uh, Elk River, Otsego, Albertville, St. Michael, Hanover, and 14 homes in the city of Dayton. And <laughs> yeah, it, that's a 25% increase. It was 12 the year before, but we're rapidly growing in the city of Dayton in, um, in Wright County. And I have served in the House for four years, and I'm now on my fifth year in the Senate. Um, enjoy being here a great deal. So. Glad to be on the committee, and thank you. Thanks. Uh, Senator Benson, you kind of snuck in on the side there. So. Hi, I'm Michelle Benson, Senate District 31. I am starting my sixth year on various human services committees. Excited to be back. Excited to focus on some core reforms in some really critical areas, and glad to be serving on the committee. My name is Matt Klein, and this is my sixth day as a senator, and I'm pleased to be on the committee. Uh, I represent the communities of South St. Paul, West St. Paul, Mendota Heights, Invergrove Heights, and a little bit of Egan. Hi, my name is Jeff Hayden, and I represent Senate District 62 in South Minneapolis. This is my, I guess, sixth year in the Senate. I spent three years uh, in the House prior to that, so this is my ninth year in the legislature, and I've spent uh, the majority of the time on this, our committees that are similar to this. Uh, I uh, was also selected to be the DFL lead uh, for this committee, so I look forward to working with all of you, uh, as well as with the chair, uh, and trying to uh, see uh, if we can be uh, successful for the folks uh, uh, that depend on us uh, in, in Minnesota. So, so thanks again, uh, and thank you guys for being here. I'm Jerry Ralph. I'm from Senate District 14, which is St. Clouds, St. Augusta, Waite Park, and two townships, one in Benton and one in Sherburne County. Uh, as uh, Senator Klein said, I'm six days rather than six years into this, so uh, looking forward to this important work that we're going to do, uh, hopefully be able to do some good things for the, for the state of Minnesota. I'm John Hoffman. I represent Senate District 36, which is Brooklyn Park, Champlin, and Coon Rapids. This is my second term, uh, being first elected in 2012. Served on uh, Health and Human Services Policy uh, for four years. Prior to that, I did compliance for uh, Health Resources Service Administration under Title V state block grants, as well as early intervention under Part C of IDEA. I did compliance federally and worked as a technical assistance provider with the University of North Carolina, providing support to states when it comes to children and families birth to eight. So I'm glad to be part of this human services reform. Um, it's going to be a fun bailiwick for me. Thank you. Uh, Senator Utke. Uh, Paul Utke. I represent District 2 in northwestern Minnesota. Um, and I am just starting my first term and look forward to uh, working with this committee as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, Senator Tony Laurie, I represent Senate District 11. I live in Carrick. Uh, Senate District 11 is most of the I-35 corridor between Duluth and the Twin Cities, the deep rural part of it. And uh, Chair Abler, I think you said um, elected office held before, so I should include nine years as a town board member ahead of my service in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Minnesota Senate. Um, you know, we always joked at the town board that you had to die in order to get off the town board, but I did find another route, and, I, and I'm happy to be here for my 11th year. Hi, my name is Scott Jensen. I'm a family doctor in Watertown, Minnesota. I represent Senate District 47, which is essentially Carver County. I've been serving you proudly for 147 hours, and when you're Norwegian, it seems like I've been here four years. And we have a special guest, uh, Senator Isaacson. Who are you? 
Uh, thank you. I'm uh, six days in as well. I'm an educator and I'm auditing uh, this uh, committee to see what's going on and learn a little bit more about health and human services. Thank you. Thank you, members. If you remember, I invited those who wanted to come and learn more about human services, and I'm glad we had a person take us up on that offer. Uh, and then staff, uh, how should we do that? Go ahead, Karen. I'm Karen Larson. I'm Senator Abler's LA, and I'm CLA for him also. I've been here since last, when Senator Abler started uh, last February. So this is all new to me. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Larissa Fisher, committee administrator for this committee and also aging and long-term long care policy. Uh, I'm Dennis Albrecht. I am the fiscal analyst for uh, Health and Human Services, uh, both of the committees. I've been with the Senate for 12 years. This is my eighth year on this committee. I'm Joan White, Senate Counsel, and I've been here a long time. <laughs> I'm Liam Monahan. Uh, I'm a legislative analyst with the Senate Counsel's Office. This is my third session. And there's some partisan and pages there. Just stand up, Peter, and yell who you are. It takes a lot of people to run a committee, and we're grateful for all the support staff. Uh, Commissioner, do you want to come and say hello for just a couple minutes? And um, while she's coming, just in the intro part, I, some people are confused about the scope of this committee. Um, if you, uh, and the other one, the other, Senator Benson's committee, if you put the word care after health care, that'll give you a hint. Uh, we have all DHS pretty much except for the health care components, Medicaid, uh, Minsure, et cetera. Uh, and uh, she also has operations under her. So, uh, Commissioner, welcome to the committee and thanks for giving us a few minutes on this snowy day. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for having me and thank you, members. Um, I just, I'm Emily Piper, I'm the Commissioner of Human Services and wanted to just take a moment to introduce myself to um, the new faces in particular on this committee. Um, I've been Commissioner for a little over a year now. Um, Governor Dayton appointed me last December. Prior to that, I was his general counsel, so I was his legal counsel in his office. Um, I'm a lawyer by training. I was in private practice for several years before I came to state service with Governor Dayton's administration. And um, I'm excited for the opportunity to work with you all on some of the really thorny, sticky, challenging issues that we have in the department. We serve over a million people every year. We have um, about 6,400 employees in our agency and of course um, partner with counties in the delivery of human services in the state of Minnesota. And so we're very proud of our human services system. We know that there are opportunities opportunities to tackle the challenges that we face in new ways. And I really look forward to partnering with you in that work. We have over 200 facilities all across the state of Minnesota. We serve people in every single one of your districts and look forward to, with my staff, working with you on the is issues that interest you um, and that you want to tackle. We have um, many staff that are very eager to get to that work with you all this legislative session. So so I look forward to working with you on your priorities and your initiatives and also following the governor's budget um, being released on that as well. So thank you. And I, I know um, you're going to be uh, receiving a couple presentations today on the various areas of our agency. And please let me and my staff know if you have any further need for information. We're here to provide you whatever um, you need. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for having me. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, while Dennis is coming up, he's going to give us an overview of uh, the, the whole budget. Oh, by the way, Senator Rosen, do you want to say hello? We just introduced ourselves, so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It feels very good to say, Mr. Chair. Uh, <laughs> Senator Rosen from District 24. Thank you. That's Three. perfect. 23. Sorry. Um, and there was one thing else I wanted to say. Oh, uh, just back in the announcement part. Uh, in our structure, we're going to have two working groups, and they're not titled yet. 
and they'll be starting the last week of January, and we're still working on who will populate those. Uh, this committee has more in-depth work you could do than I think any other committee, just in terms of the lives and the challenges. There's going to be one working group on on DTNHs and the actually it's cool DTNH WI uh, OA and uh, DWRS. If you know what that is, you want to come to that. Uh, <laughs> That group. Um, the DTNH is the day training facilities that have work requirements, and also the rates are a real challenge. And so there's going to be a work group uh, that's going to start the week of the, the 24th. We'll get dates out to people. I think it's going to be at 9 o'clock, and I forget if it's Tuesday or Thursday. And so that'll be in a smaller room, but it'll be a, it, it'll be a bona fide meeting. And, um, and the other one's going to be on, uh, on kids 0 to 5. What, and we haven't thought of a title for that either, but kids uh, in with public programs that under zero to five get a lot of things that can be, uh, that they get to experience at the hands of counties and public health and the state. And so how can we make that actually be more effective for that individual child? That's the purpose of that particular one. And that's gonna be, I think, really interesting. Our plan is to have four meetings, each of those, and come out with a product of some sort. Um, if it goes badly, there'll be not much of a product if, it's, if we can kind of get the people thinking and we'll have a pretty nice product. They may continue in the fall. They may be an ad hoc thing. So we'll see how that goes. So just so you aren't caught by surprise. And um, anyway, my last uh, announcement is we have a lot of things to figure out. Um, and every member up here is actually very bright. Um, and so am I. But I don't know everything. And there's some ideas that the people in this audience or those monitoring at home they think, why don't we do that, whatever the thing is. And so please come tell me or someone else what that is you think we should do. And some of the best ideas we got in 2011 when we had that crisis time were people that came in and said, why don't we do that? Anyway, with all that, uh, Mr. Uh, Albrecht, thank you for being here, and we look forward to your presentation. Um, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, again, my name is Dennis Albrecht. I am the fiscal analyst for Health and Human Services. And the purpose of my presentation today is to give you an overview of the entire jurisdiction of Health and Human Services. So in the Senate, that's divided between two committees. Um, but once we get to conference committee, it will be combined, uh, the work of those two committees will be combined into one bill. And um, it's uh, quite a broad jurisdiction, and I just, uh, in talking with Senator Abler, thought it would be helpful for everybody to understand what the big picture looks like and how this committee's jurisdiction um, falls within that overall perspective. Um, so these, this is the list of agencies in uh, this jurisdiction. Uh, by far, the largest agency is the Department of Human Services. One thing that will be very clear when I'm done talking to you is that DHS is a very large state agency is the largest part of this budget committee. And within this budget committee, there's one program, the medical assistance program or Medicaid program, that is the vast majority of the overall spending, uh, not only at DHS, but in the entire budget. Um, after DHS, we've got D uh, the Department of Health. Um, all of these agencies quickly become uh, acronyms. Uh, the Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board, that is uh, the ambulance providers. There's the Council on Disability, the Ombudsman for Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities, the Ombudsperson for Families, the Health Related Boards, which are 16 uh, health professions, or 15 rather, um, that uh, are within the jurisdiction of this committee, and uh, lastly, Minshirt. Mr. Albrecht, just to clarify, um, th this is the sum of both the committees, and yes. and, and so um, just to, so we have most of DHS, the Department of Health, and EMSRB are with Senator Benson's other committee, for the Council on Disability, the Ombudsman's, the Ombudspersons, are with us as well, and the other health-related boards, et cetera, are with the other committee. So just to make sure people aren't confused, thank you. You can continue. Um, yes, so, Senator, Mr. Here. Chair, on hang on, Dennis, a second. Well, thank you, Ms. Chair, um, and I don't know if you or Ms. Mr. Albrecht will, can kind of address this, so I'm trying to figure out as the two committees come together, um, will that 
Well, that I'm just because I, I, I I'm not familiar with that structure because that's not the structure that we operated on. So will that come together in Senator Rosen's committee, and then and then will you and Senator Benson kind of be co-chairs, or will it be your bill or her bill? I mean, how do we how, how does that work as it goes yeah. through the process? Fair question. No, that's still kind of the structure thing. Um, the plan is that we'll have our, this is a freestanding committee, and we're going to have our accounts, and we'll have at least some kind of a sub-target that we'll work off of. There'll be, a, there'll be a bulk target that we, Senator Benz and I, have to achieve jointly, and we'll somehow figure out how to divide that up amongst ourselves, that committee. That discussion is, is quite a ways away yet. And then this bill will be referred to Senator Rosen's Finance Committee as will Senator Benson's. Um, and then they'll be combined in there in some way and then proceed as a single bill. So, Mr. Chair, we're not, we're not quite sure how that's going to look. I just want to make well, we'll, sure that... We'll get more details as we get closer, but that's just the highlight of it. And, and so said, the targets... Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on that part. We're just trying to get the overview of the money right now. So. Um, we'll take up that other discussion later, if you need. Okay. Okay. Um, but it's, Mr. Chair, yeah. it's kind of an important point as we try to understand how we're going to approach this. I mean, um, you, uh, uh, Majority Leader Gazelka had said that each committee was, you know, authorized to send bills to the floor. I mean, I think you said they'd be combined in Senator Rosen's full finance committee. Oh, when, no. well, Senator uh, Lori, so this is a finance and a policy committee. And so if a bill is only policy relative to our topic area, it's going to go off to wherever its next destination would be, to commerce or wherever. If it's a finance bill, it's going to head north to the finance committee. And I expect we'll have not very many of those bills. Maybe there's some small ones we do, then they would go up that way. But the idea was we'd combine the bills at the end. It would leave as one health and human service omnibus bill, much the same as has been customary. And I, my thinking is Senator Benson would be the chair of that and I would be on it. And, so. and combined in, once and, we get to Senator Rosen's committee, but not two finance bills getting to the floor. No, no, they would, they would go and they'd be merged into one either by a delete all or some magic of staff where they will um, travel as a single bill. Senator Rosen, I, you know, we can, yeah, go ahead, Senator Rosen. You well, can thank you, Mr. Comment. Chair, and, and, and thank you, Senator Lurie. And um, I, I believe that the way I have envision it is that uh, there will be two finances that will actually come to Senator Benson's for final push into to the finance. So there will be two budgets, one from Senator Abler's, one from Senator Benson's, and then that will fold into her budget that will go to finance. That's, and if, if I'm wrong, perhaps we have a little misunderstanding, but that's how I envision it. Yeah. It'll be functionally the same anyway. Yeah. So it's, we're gonna, and but we have our, we'll do our work. The topic areas we're working on are gonna be worked on here. So Senator Benson, maybe and, you can um, comment. Mr. We actually Chair, haven't talked about all those details. And Senator Lori, uh, there'll be one target, one spreadsheet, and so you'll be able to track in one place everything that's happening. Um, as we go forward, okay. Thank yeah. you. So, and just, uh, and so my uh, the thinking was um, with the emphasis on healthcare this year in particular, and the the complexity of all the topics we have. This way, we can focus on the, the four business areas that we have in this committee, and then the other uh, committee could focus on the two business areas that they have as well as all the reforms. And I, it, I, it actually, in practice, I think it would be easier for the public. They can, if they're worried about an MFIP program, they, they come here and they can have Tuesday and Thursday off and not have to worry about that. So um, it'll flesh out a little more in detail, but that's the, the heart of it. So, uh, Mr. Albrecht, thanks. You may continue. Um, Mr. Chair and members, continuing on, um, this uh, slide, which is on page two of your handout, if you're following along, um, this is the all funds perspective on health and human services. This is probably the only time you will ever see uh, most of these numbers. Um, after this, most of the attention will focus on the state's general fund. Um, and while these other funds are sometimes impacted, we seldom end up talking about these numbers. Um, so for the 2018-19 biennium, which is the budget the legislature will be setting this year, 
um, the Health and Human Services uh, proportion is $36.1 billion. You can see at the top that that's 45.9, almost 46% of the state's all funds budget. For some comparison and perspective, the E12 budget, all funds, is 25% of the state's budget. So when you take those two together, they are 70% of the state's budget, and the remainder would be split among all of the other seven jurisdictions, budget jurisdictions within the legislature. Uh, for human services, I think um, I would just like to point you to the general fund being 39.5% um, of the human services budget, and importantly, the federal fund being uh, just over 53% of the budget with $19.2 billion, um, most of that being in the Medicaid or medical assistance program. Uh, and members, I'm, we could spend the whole hour on this. This is meant to be a 10-minute overview just to give you the flavor. And then we're going to go into some depth, I think, in 10 days. We're going to spend uh, one of those longer Mondays uh, digesting a lot of this relative to general fund and this committee only. This is the overview of all the DHS, so um, I'm a big fan of interaction, but not right now, please, so thanks. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, so these six bullet points only give you the slightest hint of the uh, expanse of the jurisdiction of this committee. Um, Health care and long-term care, again, are going to be the major uh, topics probably that are talked about, they are certainly most of the money uh, in the jurisdiction of this committee. Um, this slide shows you um, for the general fund for uh, the entire uh, budget and how it is distributed among the agencies in the jurisdiction of this committee. Um, so again, at the top you can see that human services is 32% of the state's general fund budget. Uh, for some comparison, um, the K-12 budget, which is a very heavily general fund funded budget, is 40%. So with this uh, committee, uh, they are 72% of the budget, general fund budget. So the total general fund budget is $14.3 billion. $14 billion of that is at the Department of Human Services. This is kind of what I said at the beginning. Of, it's just a very big department, and it takes up a lot of the money and a great deal of the attention of this committee. You can see there the Department of Health is about $182 million, and the other agencies are um, much smaller shares of the general fund budget. Uh, the, for the general fund, um, the amount in 2018-19 that breaks out to the uh, budget items in the jurisdiction of this committee is about $7.5 billion, and for Senator Benson's committee is about $6.7 billion. Within the Department of Human Services, these are some, uh, and I emphasize some, of the uh, more high-profile programs, I guess we would call them, uh, medical assistance being uh, the um, most widely known, and um, after that, Minnesota Care, um, the MFIT program, uh, direct care and treatment, mental health, chemical dependency, and child welfare. Again, just the highest level overview that I could come up with. Um, this is all funds for just the Department of Human Services. Um, you can see that for them, uh, it's very similar to the, the overall budget jurisdiction in that the general fund is 40% and the federal fund is almost 54% of their budget. This slide does not show you um, here what it's supposed to, so sorry about that, but in your printout you can see how within DHS um, the amounts break down between the major uh, spending categories within the department. So uh, the top 
uh, right of the, the grab is the grant program, $696 million being 5%, and then you can just follow around there. And it will quickly become evident that health care and long-term care are the biggest parts of DHS's budget comprising 80% um, of the total spending within the agency. Um, just a couple of slides here to give you some sense of what the dynamic is within the medical assistance program. So this is the basic description of the program. It's you know a, a federal program and has federal matching funds. Those matching funds vary depending on who the population is. Uh, generally, it's 50%. Um, but the health care part for adults without children is uh, currently, I believe, 95% and uh, is phasing down to not lower than 90%. Uh, the purpose of this slide is to give you a sense of where the money and where the people are. So on the left-hand side, you can see that the spending uh, for elderly and disabled is nearly $16 billion, all funds, uh, a little over $8 billion out of the general fund. In the middle, adults without children, um, you know, is about $4 billion of spending, but virtually none of it is from the general fund. And families with children is about $6.3 billion, with about half of that coming from the general fund. Importantly, on the right-hand side, um, that's intended to show you that the elderly and disabled are not much of the population served, but they are very expensive if you look at their proportion on the left-hand side. Um, and the families with children, there are a lot of them, 700, over 700,000 on average per month, but when you look at the entire MA budget, they don't really cost all that much. Uh, moving on to the Department of Health, these are some of the things, um, some of the very many things the Department of Health does. And this is um, the all funds allocation for the Department of Health. They have about a $1.1 billion budget. Um, with only 15, almost 16% of it coming from the general fund. A great deal of their money comes through uh, regulatory fees, and that shows up um, on the line, the special revenue fund and the state government special revenue fund. They also have a significant um, federal contribution of 41.5% of their budget. Just to remind you from the beginning, these are the other agencies within the entire jurisdiction of uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, this is how those, um, how the, the funds for those agencies are allocated uh, for all funds. It's about $59 million. The vast majority of that 40 million, 40.6 million, um, is in the state government special revenue fund, and that is in the form of licensing fees for the most part. This shows the general fund allocation for those other agencies. Um, so the largest one there is the EMSRB, um, six million dollars. The Ombudsman for Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities, four point eight million dollars, and the other smaller agencies as well. This is a list, along with uh, the last um, slide, of the health-related boards. Uh, the SGSR fund is the state government special revenue fund. Um, and that, as I said earlier, those are largely the licensing fees for all of these professions that, um, that they're funded by. For the most part, these agencies don't receive general fund appropriations. Um, and because of that, they, they're really not talked about that much in the budget discussion unless they have bills before the committee. Uh, these would be in Senator Benson's committee. Um, they do have a little bit of money in other funds, the Special Revenue Fund and the Federal Fund, so about $43 million um, total spending. 
One thing I might point out for the new members on this committee is that every number you see here is missing three zeros. Um, that's an important factor. So, you know, it looks like it's forty thousand dollars up there, and it's really forty million dollars. The only, and that's true of everything that we do uh, in the legislature. Certainly, everything that comes out of our office is missing those three zeros. Um, we try often. Um, as is the case here, where you see the three little zeros under the 2018-19 total to indicate to you, to give you some guidance um, that you need to remember to add them. Um, but the only time that we really add them is when they actually go in the bill that actually spends the money. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, that's the end of my presentation, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, and uh, I think we'll hold on questions for now, but thank you for being here. And, and Mr. Coleman, if you want to bring your... Uh, crew down. Uh, we'll come to your presentation next. And so the, for the freshmen, I sent you a packet. This could be like the cover sheet of that packet. It would give you the overview of all that. The packet that you got was more related. Um, yeah, come on down. Uh, it was more related to the areas of our jurisdiction. It wasn't as inclusive, but this would be a very good header for that. And to, the takeaway is that uh, we spend about, four, this is projected for 2018 and 19, we spend about $14 billion in general fund projected between the two committees, altogether about $35 billion. And um, we are going to have to find a way to make that money work a little harder and do a few more things that we would like. And, I, um, so speaking of people who work really hard, um, Mr. Coleman, welcome. And so if um, you could spend about a half hour at the, at the most, um, and then uh, we could do the other one, then we'll take some questions if that works. And so not to hurry you or delay you with your time, but uh, thanks for being here, Mr. Coleman. And uh, you've been here in many years, and you've done a lot of good work. So tell us who you are and what you got to say. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Good to be back with you. I'm Lauren Coleman. I'm the Assistant Commissioner. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Coleman, I forgot. Also, Senator Housley is here now, and uh, she's the chair that will be overseeing this particular area. I invited her to come as well, and I'm glad she could make it. So thank you, Mr. Very, Coleman. Please. Very good. Mr. Chair, I am the Assistant Commissioner for Continuing Care for Older Adults. And um, I don't know if I'll take a half an hour. I'll, take, uh, I'll be as brief as I can and stand for any questions that uh, the committee members may have. Um, we have several divisions within my area, uh, and basically they break down into aging and adult services, nursing facilities, rates and policy, planning and aging 2030, fiscal analysis and performance measures, and operations and central functions. So those are the areas with which I am responsible. Um, it breaks down on this slide so you see who the directors or who the individuals are who, in, who are in charge of those specific uh, initiatives within my administration. And uh, you will meet all of them at some point in time during session uh, uh, and they're available to you. Um, older Minnesotans have a variety of needs and we attempt to satisfy those in several different ways. Uh, certainly people are familiar with nursing facilities and we'll spend some time uh, on that particular uh, service, but also helping people stay at home through our waiver programs, through assisted living, through other initiatives throughout Minnesota. Nutrition is certainly a, a large component of what helps older Minnesotans stay independent, as well as transportation and wellness programs. You have several pages in your packets that describe the various budget activities that uh, guide and fund our programs. I'm not going to go into detail on the narrative pages that you have, but I am going to reference a number of the programs that you will see uh, on those pages. This is trying to share with you uh, that people need supports in a variety of ways. Do not confuse that this is a one-way line, that you start with low needs and it's a, a straight line to uh, uh, really needing nursing home level of care. 
people go back and forth through this spectrum of services throughout their later years. Uh, but it does show that there are a variety of strategies that we have in supporting older Minnesotans uh, throughout the state. Um, but it gives us a way to kind of talk about what we do and how we do that. Um, the Older Americans Act is a very specific uh, area within our uh, department. It presides mainly within the purview of the Board on Aging. And the funds flow through the Board on Aging, which uh, we work with very, uh, um, uh, very diligently. And you can see that it touches a lot of Minnesotans to, throughout the course of the year. Um, also, a number of the areas that the Board on Aging are directly managing, the linkage lines, evidence-based health promotion, chronic disease self-management, again, are part of what we work with them as part of a, uh, a package of services, uh, depending on the needs of the older adult. And then there is the essential community supports, which is a relatively new program, which is really designed to uh, provide a very modest level of support for people living in the community that um, aren't necessarily eligible through the, uh, through the waivers. Now I'll get into some of the details. Alternative care is a longstanding Minnesota program. We've been at it now for uh, 20 to 25 years, and this is for people who, uh, without this support, would quickly spend down and need to apply for medical assistance. So we're supporting people in their home. It's a modest level of expenditure, averages roughly $850 a month. Uh, and we try and help people stay in their home, which is where people prefer. Uh, recently, in 2014, we were successful in demonstrating to the federal government that this, in fact, does save the federal government money. And although it was previously only funded by state funds, we now receive federal match for the alternative care program. And we're very uh, pleased with that. That provided some additional resources that were uh, very helpful during the uh, deficit budget years. Elderly waiver is our um, uh, more rapidly growing program. It is what is the alternative to people living in an institution or a nursing facility uh, longer term. Um, you can see that we support roughly 23,000 individuals on the elderly waiver, uh, and it describes some of the services that we're able to fund through this program. This is um, with the concurrence of the federal government. It is a waiver from an individual going into a nursing facility or other, uh, other institutions. And we have a set of requirements, and you'll hear more and more for the newer members of the committee about how we work with the federal government to satisfy their interest in quality, their interest in making sure they were meeting people's needs. Uh, and then home care is also another uh, portion of uh, what we do. To give you um, some proportion, uh, you, can, you can roughly think of 75% of the people in our programs are home community-based service programs. 75% are in being served in their homes. 25% roughly are being served in the nursing facilities throughout Minnesota. Talking about nursing facilities, we currently have 368 Medicaid certified facilities in Minnesota. Uh, and um, uh, per month, we have approximately 14,000 that are being supported through public pay. There is also a portion of people living in nursing facilities that are supported by Medicare, although it's a small component. And then self-pay or out-of-pocket pay is uh, the balance. Uh, roughly about 30,000 beds. And again, for those who want to get a perspective of where we've been, uh, we peaked uh, 25, 30 years ago at about 50,000 beds. And so we've been slowly but methodically 
decreasing the number of nursing facility beds in Minnesota and developing alternatives which are uh, less costly and are uh, more suited to the preferences of older Minnesotans. Um, uh, Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wasn't sure if we, you would accept questions right now. Um, I'd like to, can we get, I think this is going to go pretty quick, so if we can do questions sure, at the end, absolutely. I think that would work, and so we, we'll put you on a list. We'll get a list going. Uh, Mr. Coleman, thanks. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, a recent development is the passage of the value-based reimbursement operating system, uh, which was implemented January 1, 2016, and it is a unique, unique payment system for nursing facilities in the country in that although it's cost-based, it also has some features to it that have not been um, as vivid elsewhere. Uh, what I'm mostly referring to is the notion of quality. Minnesota, from a policy perspective, determined that we're willing to pay more for a day of nursing facility care if the facility was demonstrating a higher level of quality. So that influences the uh, the maximum that we're willing to pay for any of the 368 Medicaid certified facilities in the state. We are in the midst of a property rate study. Uh, the value-based payment system uh, is really about operating um, uh, monies, uh, direct care and support services, property or the mortgages, the physical plant, capital needs, uh, we are, we have completed all of the property assess appraisals throughout the facilities. We are beginning to uh, kind of close that chapter of receiving all of the appraisals. The window for facilities to request a second appraisal is still open, so we can't totally close it. Then we'll have to analyze it, and we will be coming before you with a report once we've been able to uh, analyze the data. Another feature that was a first in the country was the development of a nursing facility specific report card. And we're quite pleased with that. It does provide a lot of data for consumers, uh, family <coughs> members, others to look at what's the demonstrated quality for each location and how's it, how does it compare to other uh, nursing facilities in the state and you can go online and, um, uh, and see that. Community services, what does it look like? I've mentioned nutritional services, uh, family caregiving support. We're uh, very focused on that. The Live Well at Home grants, which we've used as a tool to kind of build the service sector uh, in the community. Elder Care Development Partnerships, which are regional approaches to developing services throughout Minnesota, volunteer programs. Uh, senior Linkage Line, which also has a companion disability linkage line as well as a veterans linkage line. So we kind of have a suite of linkage lines. Return to Community, which is a very specific program which is targeted to individuals who have uh, have a stay in a nursing facility that uh, expresses an interest in returning home. The unique aspect of this is it's targeted to those that are paying privately. And one would want to ask the question, why are we using resources to help people who are paying privately? Well, it's very, um, it's very explainable. If we can help people move home, it uh, preserves their assets, it preserves their resources, and they don't need to apply for public support as rapidly as if they had stayed in the nursing facility and spent down. Uh, to date, we have uh, helped 4,000 individuals return home, and uh, when we get into the aging committee later this week, we'll dive deeper into how this program works. But it's, um, it's very successful, and it is helping to manage the cost curve of older adult services in Minnesota. Uh, the Board on Aging, again, does manage some very specific programs, uh, uh, chronic disease management, dementia grants, which again is a uh, emerging 
area for all of us to be um, focused on how can we manage dementia uh, for our older adults uh, better over time. Um, again, we administer the programs for older adults. Uh, we oversee the state adult protection services system. Uh, we manage rates for the nursing homes, the services under the waivers. We have a lot of responsibility to demonstrate quality to our consumers, to our uh, federal partners, to our communities. And we do focus a lot on research and evaluation. Uh, referencing the return to community, I'd like to note that uh, once we help someone return home with a community living specialist, we don't forget about that person. We have 90-day follow-up calls. We make sure that they're successful in returning home and staying there. And we're following them for five years uh, to make sure that the program does have uh, an effective outcome. We do spend a lot of money. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's substantial. This gives you a breakdown of the proportion of what we're spending on nursing facility care and services and what we're spending in other programs. Uh, again, I'm happy to answer, try to answer any detailed questions about this, uh, but this is what it takes to support uh, a growing population um, uh, effectively. So uh, what is happening in the state of Minnesota? What are the factors that are driving our spending? And from 2010, fiscal year 2010 to about 2015, uh, our spending has been growing at about 2% because the demographics haven't shown up yet of the age wave, as well as some of these other initiatives to downsize the institutional spending, increase helping people stay at home. Those have been countering some of the pressures uh, from the demographics. But let me, let me show you, you know, point out some numbers to you. 2010, 683,000 older adult Minnesotans. 2020, which is not that long from now, uh, 965,000. 2030, which is that magical year when all of the boomers will be 65 plus and the leading edge of the boomers will be 85, uh, 1.26 million. So we're effectively doubling the population of Minnesota. And that's not unique to Minnesota. It's happening everywhere. I just zero in on Minnesota because that's what we're here to talk about. Um, so a lot of what our challenge is, is to continue to find ways uh, to be as cost effective, to help people age healthy, and to uh, support them in their community as long as possible. Um, so we have certain pressures. We're enrolling at about 3.2% a year, additional older adults. Uh, basic health care, and we get kind of lumped into basic and long-term care, uh, but basic health care, which is medical care, hospitals, doctors, et cetera, that is growing also. That is a fact of life for older Minnesotans. A portion of it is certainly covered by Medicare and we can't forget that, but not all of it is covered by Medicare. Uh, the nursing facility rates that were passed by the legislature is a contributing factor to uh, increased spending. Um, but here's to note for you, about 60% of the cost increase, the spending increase that we're seeing in uh, older adult spending is based upon rates and um, uh, increased acuity, higher needs. The system is responding to people with higher needs. About 40% of the spending increase is due to enrollment. So we, we track both. We really want to understand what are the drivers to, um, to our programs. What have we been working on? The Minnesota Adult Abuse Reporting Center, or MARC, as we refer to it, which is a uh, toll-free centralized 
uh, telephone and web-based reporting system for suspected maltreatment and abuse. We've replaced the 160 plus different telephone numbers throughout Minnesota that you used to have to call to report suspected maltreatment or abuse. Uh, quality incentives in both nursing facilities as well as home and community-based services. The alternative care, as I talked about earlier, linkage lines, health promotions. We really want to build on what we've been developing, what we've been working on uh, traditionally over the last 25 years. Return to community, report cards. We have a nursing facility report card. We need to assemble other report cards for different services, be it assisted living, be it home care. So people have a way of gauging, what am I buying? How well is this particular organization performing? Um, the Board on Aging, we've worked very closely with to focus on uh, multicultural community investments. The Korean Service Center and Wisdom Steps, which we developed with the uh, tribes, are two examples, but they're not the only examples of what we have worked with uh, the Board on. Demographics are shifting. I've mentioned that uh, numerous times. Lack of affordable housing is one of our challenges as we see more uh, lower income, older adults, the cost of housing is a challenge for us. Workforce shortages, um, uh, that is going to be one of, if not the biggest challenges we face right now. Uh, we did hold a summit along with the disability community this summer to talk about what are our needs going forward. How are we going to find the 35 to 50,000 additional direct care workers that the demographics and the needs of uh, individuals are going to require. We didn't come up with an answer, so I can't answer that question if you're curious, but we are trying to collaborate with uh, the communities on that. Uh, some ideas to consider regulatory flexibility. What's the regulatory framework that we are currently operating in, and can we find ways to be more efficient, more effective with some flexibility? Uh, regional strategies, how can, we, uh, how can we work with communities on a regional basis so that they can look at their service menu uh, broader than a specific location and share resources and share strategies. We have area agencies on aging which are currently regional based and they're looking at it from a regional base so can we uh, can we piggyback on that concept and think about uh, additional ways of serving people that way? I can't help but be uh, self-serving and always when I have an opportunity to share that we are ranked number one by the AARP scoreboard. They've done two of these uh, nationally, um, one in 2011, one in 2014, and Minnesota has ranked number one. We are the only state that is in the uh, top quartile of all five components of the scorecard. Uh, so, you know, pat yourself, pat all of ourselves on our back for that. It's tough to be on top of the mountain, though, because the other states are always calling saying, how did you do this? What are you doing? And we share. Monitor and evaluate the results of our programs. We're always looking for measuring how well are we doing, and we're open to that. And then the other thing is to relate back to the demographics and the service needs is how are we going to finance it all? There has to be some additional answers than public funding for all. And so we have an Own Your Future initiative. We're working on some creative new products that individuals might choose to purchase uh, in the marketplace. Uh, just an editorial comment, long-term care insurance as we've known it is not being bought today. It's dead in the marketplace. And in fact, most companies in Minnesota that used to sell it have gone out of the business. And so our challenge is to try to find new products for people to plan for how to fund their long-term service needs when they get to that stage of their life. So, uh, and we're always willing to talk about that topic. Uh, we don't have a silver bullet or a single answer for it but we're working on it. And with that, um, happy to answer any questions. We'll go to Senator Rosen. You had a question earlier. 
I did, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Actually, I just have a couple, if you don't mind. Um, the uh, Assistant Commissioner Coleman is, do we still have in place the critical access nursing facility that shares director of nursing together? Uh, um, and, and remote areas that, that uh, are having trouble getting yeah. the staff? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Rosen, um, the, there's, there's two questions within that. There, there is the possibility for facilities to share leadership. That isn't specifically, as I recall, tied to critical access. The critical access nursing facility has been suspended while we've been implementing the value-based reimbursement because it doesn't have the payment um, uh, impact. It was kind of the precursor to the value-based reimbursement. So it's suspended. It might come back online if we find a need and working with stakeholders for some features of that concept. Thank you. Mr. Chair. That was it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Assistant uh, Commissioner, well, that critical access was my bill, I'm just going to say. <laughs> just wondering where that was at. <laughs> the uh, nursing facility report card. Uh, can you give me a little more information on that? Is that uh, being implemented? Or can you, obviously, can you can see how many people are going on online to check uh, the report? and. Second question to that is, uh, how much time does it take the facility to fill that out? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Rosen, uh, well, the nursing facility report card has been online and uh, it's been many years now, probably 10 years or so uh, online. It evolves as we uh, become more focused on different quality indicators or different data points, but it's been available. I, sorry, I'll have to get you the information of how many views are um, uh, the report cards receiving in a given month. The most of the information that is required for the report card is mostly automated. It, it um, depends upon processes that are already a uh, requirement. For example, quality indicators which is a, a component of the report card, are already measured as part of federal compliance by nursing facilities. Survey and compliance, the survey results are already uh, done by the health department and they just download the data to us. There is some reporting that uh, needs to be done about staff turnover or some facility specific things, but it's pretty modest. The quality of life surveys uh, is something that uh, the state funds and the extent of the uh, effort on the part of facilities is to uh, host the evaluators when they come to the facility and make sure that residents who are part of the sample are available to meet with the interviewer to answer. So the, the amount of time the facility I mean, you might want to ask the providers, but the amount of time from our perspective that facilities need to spend on the data collection of the report card is pretty modest. Thank you. Questions? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Assistant Commissioner Coleman, my question is in regards to the long-term care insurance. And I'm aware that the Minnesota public employees have an opportunity to purchase long-term care insurance through their public benefits program. Is that true for their program as well, that there are, um, they are unable, that there's no competition, that there's no resource for long-term care insurance for that program as well? Or is this just in the private sector that you were referring to? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Kiffmeyer, uh, I, I hesitate to talk on behalf of um, uh, you know, the employee relations, whatever that department is. But my understanding is that the current long-term care insurance carrier that is covering state of Minnesota employees is not accepting any new applications. Okay, thank you. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know, if uh, Lauren, if you can answer my first question, but I think it's important um, that we're well aware that 53.2 percent of of the overall budget, that $19 million, those are, those are federal dollars. And, and it would be important, I think, for this committee to understand that a lot of that's tied 
you know, when you're talking about making tweaks or changes, that it's a two for one and three for one in some of those. If you could comment on that, and then as a follow up, you had um, you talked about your summit, and there, you know, there's a myth out there about a disability community, but I just wanted to find out what is the work plan for that summit because it was about the coverage of, of support staff within uh, the you know within those folks that needed the most vulnerable in our communities and and is there a way that we could get that report from you or what is the plan to move forward with that so those are two questions and Mr. I'll Coleman sit and um, that's a two hour question and so and and so if <laughs> we're going to do about three more minutes on questions um, so Senator Hoffman I <laughs> he's going to be done in a few minutes you can take him in the hallway and ask him all those questions but if you want to respond uh, with the one minute version Mr. You wanna, Chair, Mr. Chair Senator Hoffman, thank you Mr. Chair I just you know I, I I just wanted to make sure that those were queued up because it's I think those are two important issues that you know this committee not only this committee but also the policy implications that are going to come from that summit that the so-called summit that occurred and as well as understanding the financial implications of what it means on the federal side of it. So I'll be more than willing to sit down and, and have this discussion later, but I wanted to make sure that that was all part of it. I there. appreciate it. Senator uh, Housley has taken note, but I'm just, it is like a 10 minute answer. So do you want to do like the 30 second version? Uh, Mr. 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 Chair and Senator Hoffman, happy to. Uh, one, uh, your first question about federal, uh, our federal uh, partners, yes, there are always uh, conditions of um, uh, conditions of receiving funds from the federal government and uh, uh, the requirements for us to satisfy the federal um, uh, uh, partners is quite substantial. Uh, we, we have systems that document that demonstrate how we pay it. We have a quality assurance plan that has been emerging. There are always new federal regulations that are being applied to states that we have to come into compliance with. Uh, so that is a substantial component of what we are obligated to do. Or we put that 50% federal match or whatever percentage is, we put it at risk if we are deemed to be out of compliance. Uh, we do have some documentation from the Workforce Summit. I've tried to be very careful uh, in uh, making sure that the participants to the summit don't believe that the government is the only answer to solving the shortage of workers. And we intentionally brought the, the array of long-term services and support communities together so that we could avoid pitting one population against another, even though there may be some unique needs, but we need to look at, because we're all competing for that same, uh, that same direct care worker. We do have some documents that we'd be happy to share with the committee, some report outs, some themes that emerged from the uh, couple hundred people that attended, and we'd be happy to share that with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Coleman, just two quick questions. First of all, you talked about this property survey that you're doing in a report. Uh, what was what, what? What is this focused? What What are we going to use this information for? Sure, um, Mr. Chair and Senator, um, the property appraisals is to try to uh, develop, design a new property rate system that pays for nursing facilities. We're paying for the care and the services through the operating rate, but that doesn't cover the physical plant, either keeping facilities up to date uh, or rebuilding a nursing facility in the, uh, in the community. So uh, trying to find a better way of uh, financing that component, that business component, of uh, nursing facilities is what the goal is. It was part of the 2014 legislation or whatever whatever year the uh, the new system passed. Uh, thank you, Senator Ralph. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, Mr. Chairman. The other question I have: You indicated that in this return to community program, it, it it's uh, I believe your figures were 15 percent 
public care and 85% uh, private care that are taking advantage of that. Um, I'm wondering first why that is and secondly, it would seem if we are returning people to the community that would be a savings in cost to the to the public assist uh, to those on public assistance as well. Uh, am I am I correct? And and is there any emphasis being brought about to uh, to move that into the uh, public area? And again, uh, maybe just a kind of a brief answer. You can take yeah, it offline, okay, Mr. Uh, Chair and Senator. Uh, I threw a lot of numbers at you, so uh, you know perhaps they're getting a little um, a little mixed up. The return to community is focused. Uh, on private paying individuals, not people who are uh, on the public programs. And the design of it is to help them save their money by returning home. And it was part of a budget savings initiative uh, coming out of the 2011 um, history books. And we did book savings for that, and we can demonstrate how on uh, over time, it is being, it's, it's impacting the forecast for the number of people that would be spending down and going on Medicaid if not for the initiative. So uh, the state is already getting credit for this initiative. We've expanded it into assisted living. We want to expand it to all people who want to uh, return home and live in, uh, uh, live in that independent setting. Good for now. Uh, Senator Jensen, you get the last question, and we're going to move on to the next topic. I just wanted to ask you if you'd clarify a little bit where it indicates that the average number of people per month being served in the nursing homes is 14,000, then it said there are 28,000 beds, and then it said the occupancy was 87%. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Coleman. Mr. Chair and Senator, um, a number of the people on any given day are being paid for by Medicare number of the people on any given day might be paid for by private insurance. A number of people on any given day is paying out of pocket. Uh, keep in mind that the use of nursing facilities in Minnesota has been shifting, has been changing dramatically. The median length of stay in a Minnesota nursing facility now is less than 30 days. So we're not seeing the multi-year forever kind of nursing facility stay uh, as often as we did 20 years ago when there weren't alternatives. So, um, uh, so the number of beds is shrinking and the, uh, the way they're getting paid for is shifting also. Do you think part of that's because of the 21 day rule where when people are discharged from the hospital, they get 21 days in the nursing home covered and then after that it goes away and so they're making certain that they're getting out by day 21? Mr. Coleman. Well, Mr. Chair and Senator, the, uh, the 20 day Medicare skilled nursing benefit is, um, well, I'll just call it, it's a bit of a myth. Uh, it doesn't occur for everyone who is coming out of a nursing facility. Uh, it does occur for some, but for um, many, they're not eligible for that benefit even though they've been in a nursing facility. It gets, um, it gets a bit complicated, and I don't know that we want to get into it here, but there's things called observation days and all sorts of factors that are influencing whether someone can avail themselves of that benefit. And Senator Jensen, they can visit you in your office. and, and I, and so this is meant to be an overview just to, I mean, if we could spend literally a week on this topic and still not exhaust all this. But I thank you very much for coming, Mr. Coleman, and you'll be back again, I know. And uh, he works very hard, he knows a lot. Mr. And, Chair, uh, for those, members of the committee, thank you. Yeah, and thanks, uh, Mr. Koppel, if you want to come up with your crew. And uh, for those who want to dig into this more on uh, Wednesday at 8.30, and uh, that's opportunities available for people who want to come to the uh, Senate, uh, was it long-term care? and an aging committee with uh, uh, Senator Housley. And uh, at you could join us today. So, so Mr. Koppel, welcome to the committee. We're doing a whole, we've gone from one end of the spectrum, we're gonna go into uh, families and children. That's, uh, welcome to the committee and uh, tell us who you are and then start to tell us what you came to talk about, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members. Uh, my name is Jim Koppel. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Children and Family Services. 
Um, and I've been at the uh, department in this position for a little over two years. Let me see if I can get this the right way now. Good. So uh, this is just some overview. Uh, we have 334 employees. Uh, that's not a firm number. That can change daily. But uh, we're somewhere between 320 and 350 employees. Um, our divisions, you can see there are four divisions, economic assistance and employment supports, uh, houses the Minnesota Family Investment Program. That's our TANF program from the federal government. We call it MFIP in Minnesota because we always change the names to names we like in Minnesota, so it, it became MFIP. Um, so the Minnesota Family Investment Program, the Food Support Program, which is SNAP, um, Refugee Resettlement uh, Program, and uh, we move on to the second division, Child Safety and Permanency, also known as the Child Welfare uh, Division, but that's where your uh, child abuse and neglect, foster care, adoptions, et cetera, are all in that area. Uh, child Support uh, is the third division, and then the last division is Community Partnerships and uh, Child Care Services. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Uh, those are two separate entities. The Community Partnerships really is more of a grant-making area, and uh, uh, child care services is obviously uh, named for what it does. Here is the uh, org chart, so you can see the four divisions. We also have a management and operations uh, is our fifth area. Uh, Ralph McCorder is the uh, director of that. Um, myself up there, the assistant commissioner, and I have a deputy assistant commissioner, Nikki Farago. And Mr. Chair, I'm just going to continue just whip through this, and then we'll take questions at the end. Is that oh, that's how you a good would plan. I think that'll help, and then you can get the substance out there, and we'll sure. take questions at the end. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so um, who we serve? We serve families uh, with children and um, low-income families. We um, serve families served by child welfare, which comes in all shapes and forms. There's no... Um, Necessarily, there's some predictors in the child protection system, but by and large, they come from all over and all incomes, um, et cetera. Custodial and non-custodial parents and their children, this is our child support program. Counties and tribes, so if, geographically, we serve all counties and all tribes. And we have uh, community-based partners, and that's a uh, majority of which is through our grant-making program. Uh, I'll, I'll, talk more about the specifics of what we provide in each of these areas as I talk about the programs themselves. So uh, we partner with counties to provide child support services. Each county, through their own operations, has a child support uh, uh, department. And so they work at identifying and uh, helping to collect uh, child support. I would say this uh, for numbers, there are 360,000 custodial and non-custodial parents that are impacted by our child support program and 250,000 children. Uh, the child support program collects and disperses over $600 million uh, a year. And um, Next uh, is our child care assistance program. Again, this is a county-administered program, so all the co each county runs this program. Uh, we serve about 30,000 children a month. About half of those children are on that program because the, their parents are on MFIP, and half of those uh, children come through our child care uh, assistance program, which is a, a low-income program and parents pay part of the uh, fee and we pay part of the child care uh, fee. Food support is a large program. Uh, it's uh, our SNAP program. We help with food to, and serve food to more than 466,000 Minnesotans. The average monthly benefit is about $109 per person. Child welfare services, um, we have about uh, 
13,600 children who experience out-of-home placement in, over a given year. Uh, I would note that the uh, program itself has grown dramatically. I'll talk more about that, but uh, you know, a couple of years ago we had governor's task force on this issue. There was a, a child death that was uh, quite alarming, and uh, so we've had a lot of growth in that particular area that I'll talk more about in a minute. Economic assistance. Uh, our MFIP program, our Minnesota Family Investment Program, serves 34,000 families an average month, and almost double that number in terms of children. So um, the majority of, of people served in MFIP are children. Our refugee resettlement services um, are offered to an average of about 475 people a month. <clears throat> Now you can see our forecasted grants. So our Minnesota Family Investment Program is forecasted program and uh, $1.1 billion. Uh, these are biannual numbers. The, um, this includes the Child Care Assistance Program uh, and the North Star Ch Care Program for Children. Uh, these are some of the larger programs we run. And um, the, the forecasted program um, for um, North Star was just passed, I believe, in 2015. Um, could have been, I don't think it was 2016, but I think it was 2015. So that program became forecasted. That's a newer program. It just started in uh, January of 2015, uh, and that's an um, adoption and foster care assistance uh, program. <clears throat> um, so you can see then the grant programs we run, such as the SNAP program, which is our food support, our basic sliding fee, uh, child care program, and uh, support services, about $1.77 billion. And then administrative costs uh, for children and family services, about $91 million. So you have a, about $2.7, $2.8 billion, and you have about $91 million in, in the admin costs uh, to uh, oversee those programs. So these are just an index for your pages. Uh, and what I'll run through quickly now is a uh, description of uh, what we try to do in terms of uh, stabilizing families with low incomes. Uh, the family, Minnesota Family Investment program provides job counseling, financial assistance to help stabilize about 67,000 children and more than 34,000 families. So I mentioned earlier we have a caseload of 34,000 families. In those families are 67,000 children. Child support services help support and stabilize families by establishing paternity, identifying, modifying, enforcing child support court orders, uh, collecting those payments and issues. Uh, supports to the families. This is over $600 million a year, comes in, goes out. Mm -hmm. And child care assistance provides subsidies to low-income families for 30,000 children in a month to help improve outcomes for the most at-risk children and their families by increasing access to quality child care, but also providing those families, many of which are working uh, with a, a steady place to keep their kids safe and uh, so it's about what we call a two-generation approach in that the parents are able to work because they have child care and the kids are in child care and getting ready for school. Child and economic grants, uh, support grants. Again, this uh, supplemental nutrition uh, assistance program, our SNAP program, 466,000 Minnesotans receive it. I mentioned it's just over $100 uh, a month per person as the average. Uh, we administer nearly 200 grants annually to help people in poverty meet their basic needs for food, clothing, and shelter. This is the Office of Economic Opportunity, uh, which is part of one of our divisions, which does a, a lot of this grant making. You've uh, probably, I won't go into the details of those, but you're familiar with uh, um, youth housing, the homeless youth, money to, for, to address homeless youth, money to address uh, sex trafficking. Uh, those types of grants all run through uh, the Office of Economic uh, Opportunity as well as 
um, money for the community action programs that are all across the state. And Mr. Koppel, just to point out, um, those budget narrative pages were part of the packet that people had sent out. If you would like those, uh, we can get those for the members if there's an interest in that. So, and that's also true of the uh, previous narrative, the previous presentation as well. Maybe we'll make a point to get those for the next two present presentations on Wednesday. Mr. Koppel, uh, continue. Yes, thank, thank you, you Mr. Well. Chair. Thank you. Uh, and any, uh, as uh, the chair has stated before, too, we can uh, add any additional information to any of these issues that you find interesting and want more information on, we can supply. Uh, children and family services uh, and, and keeping children safe. I mentioned this earlier. This is an area where we've done a lot of work uh, to improve the system of uh, child protection in Minnesota. Uh, about two and a half years ago, there was a child death. And um, as a result of that, the governor's appointed a task force. That task force meant to review uh, some of our front end work in terms of uh, identifying kids at risk and screening, uh, whether they get screened in or screened out and how their investigations are you know, conducted, et cetera. And there were uh, over 90 recommendations in that, uh, coming from that task force. Uh, those recommendations uh, about, I, I don't have the exact count, but about a third of those are in uh, have been done, uh, about a third are in process. Uh, it's a big lift and we take them in a uh, kind of a strategic way of how we digest them. Some of them require additional legislation. Uh, we bring those uh, to you and uh, also there's a legislative task force that has overseen this as well. And that legislative task force uh, meets uh, during session, but also off session. As, and uh, there will be a report coming from that legislative task force to you, updating you on all of the progress that's been made and some of the issues that remain to be addressed. Um, and we also work with uh, um, parents and, and community and local governments to provide supports to reduce the risk of child abuse and neglect. One of the things it's important to realize is, you know, this child protection is a deep end system. It, it is after a family has failed, you know, after an event has occurred, and it's really trying to reconstruct that family uh, with services or to move that child out of the family and put them in, in uh, foster care, all of which is very traumatic to children as well as to families. Uh, one of the big goals in, in our area and where we try to work collaboratively with other programs is to avoid coming into this system at all, is to, to avoid that crisis, to try to have prevention services and early identification so we're not dealing with uh, the crisis all the time and responding to it. Um, but when that happens, we have to be swift and we have to make sure we have the support systems. And North Star Care for Children is the bottom one up there is when children are removed uh, from their homes and uh, are either in foster care or are moving to adoption, North Star makes sure that the benefits continued. We used to have a problem in Minnesota where uh, people were, in foster, were foster parents, but they didn't adopt because if you adopted, you lost some of the benefits. So North Star keeps that um, consistent. So once we did that, we had hundreds more in that very year we did it. Uh, more adoptions, and we've continued to have a high adoption rate, but we also continue to have um, Oh, about 500 kids right now waiting for adoption. So we're always um, pushing that along. Um, then innovations. So uh, one of the things we try to do in child care, when you think about our child care system, it's not just a place where you can keep children while their parents work, but it's also really a place where children can develop in a healthy way um, it, the, the brain science that has just increased dramatically over the last several years on all of the possibilities that children have when they're babies and the, uh, their uh, synapses and the, the brain, the workings of the brain are, they're all Einstein's, you know, they just come out and they are, can just soak it up and we need to accomplish as much as possible in those early years, both in terms of a healthy physical development, but also a healthy brain development. We're not taking advantage of that like we could. The quality rating system that we have called Parent Aware is really trying to construct a, an early childhood system where we teach that kind of quality to providers and providers use that quality in instruction and work with children. And 
through that, we believe that we will have a higher quality early childhood system. It's expensive. We all know child care is expensive, and we ought to be getting for that as much healthy development of our children as we can. About, uh, and I should say about now, uh, at this point in time, while the Parent Aware has only gone statewide two years ago, uh, we have about 40% of our kids who are on child care assistance in a Parent Aware rated child care. Uh, provider. So we've made a lot of progress in a short period of time. Secondly, I'd like to talk about the created uniformity for all our uh, Minnesota's economic assistance programs so that we have the same asset and uh, accounting and evaluation, determine of self-employment income, the earned income disregard, and, and verification of, in of documents um, across all of our income assistance programs. So what that does is simplifies the application process, ha helps counties with administration so that they're not collecting all different kinds of documents for different programs. Um, and um, this significant efficiency was gonna help with uh, uh, time and cost savings for counties. <clears throat> this was a, uh, a joint initiative between the counties and the state uh, and we worked a long time on it, and we've made a lot of progress. Did I get... Oop. Jump to the end. Sorry, I, I know maybe some of you wanted that, but so I, I got to go back to reforms to child support. Um, this is um, bullets here. We created an opportunity for parents to pay online and, and uh, uh, as of November 2016, 2,400 non-custodial parents have been, make, have been making payments online, about three and a half million dollars using this tool. So it's a new tool, but it's being used and it's only gonna grow because that's the way, wave of the future. A uh, supported legislation create a child a support task force. That task force will make recommendations to the legislature uh, on child support guidelines. Um, in the task force itself includes legislators, parents, and child support professionals. We passed legislation allowing medical only child support modifications. This was to conform with the ACA. And lastly, we passed legislation increasing MFIP child support disregard. This is probably uh, one of my favorite things we've done in, in 2015, this was passed, implemented in 2016. So when, when we had, this is just thinking about a low income family on MFIP. And if you think about that, you have a family getting a, um, a grant of around $600 a month. Uh, and um, if the non-custodial parent is paying child support, let's say there's two kids, and they're paying child support $200 a month, we would take that $200 a month as a state, we collect it from them, we pass it on to the parents, and we lowered their grant by $200. So they got $600 a month. Even though they were receiving child support, we took it, basically. The federal government actually allows states to, to pass through or disregard up to $200 for two or more children and $100 for one child. Um, and, and and allow that to go through, and then to actually get that money for the absent parents to actually have a role in the family, to be recognized for support. And so we uh, introduced that in 2015, it was passed 2015, now implemented, and now that money is passed through uh, and disregarded, which is great, because another statistic is when families go off of MFIP, leave MFIP, and they have child support, they're much less likely to come back on MFIP because they have a relationship. There's two parents financially invested in the child, and that's what we all want. Um, innovations, we leveraged uh, uh, a lot more money down from the federal government to in our SNAP program. Um, the employment and training program had lagged for some time. Now our employment and training uh, program we have uh, brought in a consultant. Uh, we were given it by the federal government. We were one of 10 states to be named a SNAP to Skills state uh, for innovation. We now get um, unlimited use of a 
consultant at, uh, out of Seattle who, who has done all this innovative uh, employment and training work with SNAP uh, recipients. And we're very excited about the progress we made. There's a lot of federal money that you can draw down for activities identified uh, that are going on in nonprofits and counties right now. And we haven't done a good job of drawing that money down in the past. We estimate it where in the coming year we'll draw down about $4 million, we're hoping. Um, it, that money that we'll be able to pass through for those activities to the nonprofits and counties that are doing that work. Child Protection Disparity Grants, this was the first. Um, in 2015, legislature passed $26 million more funding for child protection. One and a half million of that money went to develop disparity grants because we have a disproportionate number of kids of color, especially African American, Native American children in our child protection system. So we have um, gone through the RFP process and have given out um, that money to um, now 10 uh, different uh, organizations, uh, four of which were Native American and uh, they're all under in, in uh, innovative areas, innovative activities uh, to lower the number of children in our child protection system. Uh, things to build on. Let me jump past that. Um, recommendations from the governor's task force, ongoing, lots of work. And lots of work still to be done. Uh, it's one of our big challenges. Recommendations from the foster care work group, which followed the uh, governor's task force on child protection, the foster care work group. Um, uh, had recommendations for North Star, the system I was just talking about on supporting uh, kids in foster care and, and adoption. Recommendations from the Child Support Task Force, which will be coming later, as well as the Task Force on Access to Affordable Child Care. Uh, that was a legislative task force that had been meeting this past year and they'll be issuing a report uh, to be considered uh, as well. I could just say as a side note, I'm very excited about the work group, um, zero to five. I can't tell you how much, um, how expensive it is to, to administer and oversee a child care program uh, that spends over $10,000 per family to help them get their child care. And yet, combine that with uh, other programs that are um, happening in the Department of Education and the Department of Health and the amount of money that's being spent on those families and on those children and to have a more coordinated approach and be able to talk openly about how we can do that, uh, much more efficient use of the money and we can begin to see or develop the outcomes we want for those children uh, for the amount of money we're spending. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that and uh, certainly appreciate it. Um, the one thing I would, uh, uh, would mention in the drivers, um, you can see the Minnesota Family Investment Program, the MFIP program, there has not been an increase in the, in the benefit since 1986. So in 1986, that cash benefit in our MFIP program, uh, on average, paid the rent of a two-bedroom apartment. Uh, today, that um, wouldn't pay for a one-bedroom apartment. Uh, so it, it's lost its value. Uh, it, it has, um, uh, it needs to be addressed. I think things like the disregard for child support, you know, where you can pass additional money through, that helps. Uh, we have a housing specific, a uh, $110 housing uh, grant increase. Little things that we've done to try to ameliorate that, but it's very difficult. Child protection is a big driver. You can see up here that the number of children accepting child maltreatment reports through the first three quarters of each year has increased 72% from 2012 to 2016. When, when those reports are accepted, that means there's either an investigation assessment, there's an increase in out-of-home placement, that means there's an increase in foster care or the need for foster care, uh, shortage of foster care parents, uh, the uh, shortage of services, um, all of these things are put a great deal of pressure on our child protection system. Child care, there's 5,300 families, 400 families that are waiting to receive child care assistance. So just to understand the two parts of child care, the part that's the MFIP child care, that's forecasted. Everybody who needs it gets it. The part that 
is for low income working families, that is a capped amount. So we give that out in a formula to all the counties. They have so much to work with. When they get to close to that top of the, their amount, they stop taking families. So there's over 5,400 families right now. Um, in some years, it's 6,000. I would say this about it. It's a fake number because it, I, I compare it to uh, uh, when you go to a restaurant and there's a six hour waiting list uh, you know, to eat dinner, you don't sign up. You just walk away, go somewhere else. That's exactly what happens with a lot of these families. There are 15,000 families, about nearly 15,000 families who are eligible for this program and not participating. That's the real number. And then of those 15,000, 5,400 of them are on a waiting list, but there's easily that many who would jump on a waiting list if it went down, you know, or we lowered it. So it's, it's, a, it's a big pressure. Uh, the other thing I won't spend a lot of time on right now is child care reauthorization. The federal government, uh, Congress passed in 2014 a reauthorization of the child care development block grant. <clears throat> um, and this block grant requires certain changes in, in our program. And actually these are changes that we used to have in our program but have gone away over the years. So um, it's to pay providers at, at a, a, increased uh, rates. Um, and it also is to stabilize the program. So families that sign up and get their children in child care basically have a year of stability for that child care so that it's more predictable than we make it now. Um, that's going to cost some money. And uh, um, if we don't do it, um, number one, it's, it, it makes our programs less effective. We're losing a lot of providers now because of the reimbursement system is low. Um, but also, we could lose additional federal monies because of uh, the block grant. Will be, we are out of conformity now. Right? Uh, we have one-year waivers that we have obtained uh, to get into conformity. So you never know what will happen, but it, it's not good. The um, notable mentions, I would say, you know, we're making changes how we guide and support um, counties. We have a 24, uh, we're in a 24 a daily line that they can call anytime they're confused or, ner or nervous about a case in child protection. They can call in. We can review a case with them, help them through the process. Uh, we do a review of counties. Um, look over in all their cases. Uh, we hit all the counties every three years, so uh, that we try to keep a quality assurance uh, partnership with our counties. Economic assistance, uh, one notable mention there is that our SNAP program received a $1.8 million bonus. Uh, majority of that goes to the counties um, for use on county SNAP programs, but uh, or state SNAP program. But um, what I would say is the reason we got it is we uh, we lowered our error rate, and we were one um, of the top states in terms of doing that. And lastly was we, we were reporting data on our error rate. We were one of 11 states that was honest in our reporting. So all, there were not just all the other states, all the other states and territories um, were reporting erroneous data. They were kind of fixing it before they gave it to the feds. We weren't. And uh, we still lowered our error rate. We still got uh, top three for lowering our error rate. And we did it the right way. So I was very proud of that. That just happened. We're, we haven't even put out the press release yet, but we're, we're going to. And then lastly on that, I would mention that we are continuing to move our, our uh, programs over to our tribes, our, our partners, just like our counties. Our tribes are very capable, increasingly capable of running their own programs. Uh, they have better outcomes when they run them. We have turned over um, our child protection uh, programs to two tribes. We are in the process of doing it with two more. Our TANF and SNAP programs and child care programs are all moving in the same direction. Not all tribes are interested, uh, but for the ones that are, and they're the large ones, uh, Leech Lake, White Earth, uh, Red Lake, Mille Lacs, uh, are all active uh, in running their own uh, programs, and we're working with them, transferring the technology uh, for them to do that.
The last slide, a little bit of uh, what I was mentioning earlier about the monthly cash assistance for family of three in Minnesota is $532. So in 1986, that amount would cover a $480 housing and urban development HUD fair market rent for a two bedroom apartment. Uh, today that is $1,160. So it's another, it's that example of how we stress families out and so the, but the, but I, I guess what I want to close with is really not talking about we're doing a terrible job and you're not giving enough money to MFIP and uh, we can argue about it or whatever. It's really about the fact that what we want to do is move these families out of the MFIP system and off of these public programs to a self-sufficiency. We want to get jobs, get the training, get the skills, and get the jobs, and have an income, and not be dependent on these programs. But the problem is, sometimes while they're on these programs, and the grants are so low, we trap them there. If we don't have good training and education programs, and they're getting $580 a month, uh, it, it freezes. They, they become paralyzed. And so we trap them in a system that's meant to be a transitional system, transition out. We want to get them out. Uh, that's what we're using a lot of our SNAP employment and training dollars on, is to develop this infrastructure across the state to do more of that. But we also have to pay attention to the fact that while they're on these public programs, the stronger we can make this transition happen, the better it's going to be. And sometimes we just don't put enough into it. And that's what that last statistic is trying to show. And with that, I conclude my remarks. Hope I, I probably went too long, didn't I? No, that was perfect. It was, uh, we were hoping for substance, and both you and Mr. Coleman and Coleman gave us a good overview with a lot of, a lot of content to build on. And I'm, I appreciate that some of the newer members are still here listening. And uh, these overviews can be, you know, not all that fun. But this was a really good dose, I think. And I think for the members, if you, there's, we have four areas that we're going to be dealing with: Fayetteville Continuing Care and now Children and Family Services. But in that, there's four areas as well, the economic assistant uh, part, child safety, child support, and the community partnerships and child care. And so if you just kind of just begin to create little compartments, it, you kind of get the handle of it. So we have time for some questions. Uh, uh, Senator Jensen. Perhaps this is more informal than most questions might come. But in May, when you look back on the work that this committee does, what would you consider a successful performance on the part of this committee, Senator Abler? Good question. Uh, we, uh, actually, that's the point of having the working group. I would like, my definition of success in our area, we spend some $7 billion over the biennium in cash in the current biennium, is to make every dollar accomplish something and achieve the mission that it was designed to do. And the dollars that aren't doing that uh, do something else. And I don't know that we're going to lower the spending number much. I don't know what our target's going to be. And, um, but, and so um, you gave me a chance to use my little analogy. So, um, you know, the, this long after I'm retired <clears throat> and, uh, and all of us are gone from here, everybody in the room is long gone, there will be a need for the work that this committee does. Uh, and there will be challenges and people moving through the system, but as long as people are moving and no one is stuck, I think Mr. Koppel would agree that's a good thing. Um, there's a lot of programs that get developed that sound really good at the time. Uh, in your home, if your refrigerator gets full and the bottles are falling out, hitting your foot, you know, if you get the late night snack and here comes the bottle at you, you think, oh, I better clean out that fridge. In government, it seems like, let's just buy another fridge. And there are fridges lined up. And in your own fridge, you don't, it's, it's not considered anything bad if you go and kind of organize, put the two pickle jars that are the same kind of pickles and you put them together and now you have one jar cutting, taking half the space and it's actually a more efficient pickle jar. Around here they call that a cut. And that's just a restructuring and a focus. And so under the four years that I am privileged to be here with you, they have to keep us four years as long as we stay uh, with all the array of people that are here and those who have left already. Um, I'd like to look at everything and make sure that we've, we've done our best job as policymakers to give the department the tools it needs to touch the million one lives that we touch now and move them through the system that maybe someday there'll be less than that many. But the pipeline will be consistent. 
So that's my top of my head answer. Anybody else? Senator Hoffman, you must have a comment. Lengthy question, please, would you? <laughs> You're just gonna, this is complicated. Funny. You know, it's funny, I, Senator Abler, I, would, uh, I was joking with Senator Rosen when you and I were talking rate methodology four years ago. And oh, yeah. She swore she'd never sit in between us, so I purposely went over there just so she could be in there. But this was a good overview. I, I'm, it was really, it was quick to the point. I mean, you walk away, and I got lots of questions. I got lots of direction, and... You know, my, my thoughts were going, especially when you're talking about the early childhood, the comprehensive, coordinated, and, and collaborative effort. You know, back in 1986, the federal government told states to do that, do that when, it, when they're doing early intervention services. And I don't know, um, and to hear that come out again, I'm glad we're still having that conversation in that direction. And, and as you're moving toward the tribes, um, you know, there is four tribes out of our 11 that get extra early intervention dollars through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, through the Department of Education that come federally to the state. And it'll be interesting as we uncover just, you know, what we're doing to achieve, you know, specific outcomes and having that conversation. So I look forward to the working groups you're setting up, Senator Abler, as you look at the comprehensive, coordinated, and collaborative system. So this, I just wanted to say thank you for doing this. This was a good overview, and I appreciate that. I also believe if you're done, you should just go home. Uh, so I want to thank people for their attendance, for the audience who stayed and those who are watching at home and those who um, are digging in on this thing. And I want to just, I'm going to continue to call for people with their ideas. Uh, and if there's clients who are watching this or you know, people that provide services and you wish we did something different, this is the time to do it. We have a billion four, but I'll assure you, not a lot of that's going to come our way. And so. For the services we want to improve upon, we need to take what we have and you know, get those pickles all squared away. Uh, Mr. Koppel, your tribute to your department and the work you do, and uh, appreciate you coming to spend the time with us. Thank and you. Uh, we're going to meet again on um, Wednesday, which will be in January, not in June. Uh, in a couple days from now, we'll do two more areas, uh, the uh, community support and the, uh, the direct care and treatment. So uh, with that, members, thank you for your attendance. Uh, we're adjourned.